I'm delighted to have the opportunity to uh, say a few words at the beginning. I wanted just to say a few words, though, first about the Vice-Chancellor, um, so that we can all perhaps get to know him and his uh, perspective on Africa, even though he's, he's not with us. So you may know, or you may not know, um, that he has quite significant connections with Africa. Uh, in an earlier role, he acted as an external advisor to the governments of Kenya and Uganda on economic development, social development, and legal reform. Stephen, too, is a lawyer. He was present as a UN observer for South Africa's first democratic elections in 1994, so almost exactly 24 years ago. So the issues that we will be talking about today, uh, building scientific capacity, enhancing governance, supporting development in Africa, are ones that are very close to his heart. A little bit about me then. So I'm Pro Vice Chancellor. I have responsibility for international relations. I took up that part of my portfolio um, in 2016. My predecessor, Jennifer Barnes, is with us today. Um, and it's great to see her. Is, and that's a testament to just how much Cambridge Africa gets into everyone's heart and how they feel um, sort of so much part of it. And my first glimpse of it was before I took up that part of my portfolio, when it was suggested that I might come along to a meeting of the Cambridge Africa Steering Group just to see what it was. So I snuck into the back of a room in the old schools, and I sat and listened to the discussion about the, the achievements, but also the very real challenges faced by the group. And what I took away from even that very first meeting and that taster was that this initiative was quite unique, not only within Cambridge, but within the wider community of researchers helping to contribute to the acceleration of Africa's development. The work conducted under the auspices of the Cambridge Africa programme over the past decade is, I think, now widely recognised as an essential part of this institution's global mission. It's deeply embedded in the university's activities, but it also reflects through those concrete initiatives the kind of institution that all of us here at Cambridge want this institution to be. David has referred to the massive progress made in sub-Saharan Africa, but he's also alluded to some of the pressures and the ways in which um, progress can be accelerated. So we know that greater investment is needed at all levels to nurture a culture of scientific inquiry. One recent survey of African scientists at the start of their career suggested that a lack of appropriate infrastructure is a key factor hindering scientific progress. There are challenges too around the collection of data and it is difficult, as we all know, to make concrete improvements in higher education or in scientific research if you don't have the basic information on which to build a solid uh, sort of structure. We know in Africa, and indeed in Cambridge and everywhere, there's an urgent need to bridge the gap between women and men in science. And this can only be achieved by fostering equal opportunities in education, in career progression, and in academic leadership. So very significant, long-term structural challenges. But these and other problems will ultimately have to be identified, understood, and tackled by African scholars and researchers themselves. So those of us living in developed economies with an interest in Africa know that we must walk a fine line between being ambitious for the change we want to see, but remaining modest about what we can do to help promote and accelerate that change. We know we can't parachute in with fixed solutions to uniquely African problems. That is not our place. And nor can we be complicit in a model of education and learning that takes some of the brightest minds 
away from their home countries. And that's why the Cambridge Africa program is so valuable. And that's why it has thrived over the past 10 years. Because it relies on real partnership, because it addresses and seeks to reverse the continent's brain drain. Cambridge Africa is about brain mobility. Research and mobility, we know, is strongly correlated with world-class research. Cambridge Africa brings together the hard sciences and the humanities in new and exciting ways. And Cambridge Africa seeks to address African priorities in Africa, taking a lead from African researchers. So let's just look at one recent initiative, a series of interactive video-linked seminars delivered by more than 20 university researchers in Cambridge, beamed directly into lecture rooms and classrooms at Makerere University in Uganda to complement a master's program in immunology. A simple idea, yet so effective and potentially transformative. So there are serious issues, but this is a 10th anniversary. It's also a moment to pause, to celebrate, and to congratulate. And in particular, to congratulate and thank the leadership of the Cambridge Africa program, David Dunn in particular, but also Pauline and others in the excellent team of program managers and program coordinators. I also want to congratulate and thank the champions of Cambridge Africa and its program across the university for their expertise, for their enthusiasm, and for making this a truly impactful and interdisciplinary program. And finally, I want to warmly thank all of our partners, the universities and the research institutions in Africa who guide us and who grind us in what we try to do, the funders and the friends of the program, without whom none of it would be possible, and perhaps most of all, those individual African students and researchers who form that bridge between Cambridge and Africa and who are the people who will carry all this extraordinary work into the future. So here's to 10 more years of the Cambridge Africa programme and then many, many more. Thank you all. I'm really looking forward to a fruitful day of discussion.